So welcome everyone to the virtual book talk, Climate Change in Journalism, Negotiating Rifts of Time. It's really great to see you all here and thank you for your time and joining us. My name is Hannah Morris and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania, where I'm currently working on a book tentatively entitled Apocalyptic Authoritarianism, Climate Crisis, Media and Power. I'm also the co-editor of Climate Change in Journalism, Negotiating Rifts of Time, and I will be the moderator for today's events. So before I introduce my co-editor, Henrik Bodker, who will provide a brief introduction of the motivation behind our book project and its main contributions, I would like to thank Dean John Jackson from the Annenberg School for the opportunity to organize today's event and for his support, along with Patricia Linder, Marley Goldschmidt, Audrey Romano, Kelly Fernandez, Julie Sloan, and Andre Spolari, without whom this book talk would not have been possible. I would also like to thank Simon Richter, Elizabeth Main, Melissa Brown Goodall, and the amazing team behind Climate Week at Penn, of which today's event is a part of. And for those of you who haven't already, please be sure to check out the incredible lineup of climate change events that are being held this week as a part of Climate Week at Penn. So in terms of the logistics for today's virtual book talk, we will begin with an overview of the edited volume by Henrik Bodker, then three of the volumes contributing authors, Catherine J. Bruns, Dominic Hind, and Lena Solis Rojas will briefly introduce their chapters. Following this, we will move into a round table discussion with each of the authors, and we will close with an audience Q&A during the last 15 minutes or so of our um, book talk. For the audience Q&A, please feel free to type questions and submit them via the chat box, and I will read them aloud for you. Alternatively, alternatively you can press the raised hand icon um, when the audience Q&A begins, and I will call on you, and you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Please be sure to keep your microphone muted at all other times during today's event in order to not distract from the presentations and the discussion. So before I turn it over to Henrik, I will introduce him and the three other speakers here with us today. Henrik Boker is an associate professor in the Department of Media and Journalism Studies at the School of Communication and Culture at Aarhus University, Denmark. He's currently working on issues of circulation and temporality in digital journalism. A monograph entitled Journalism, Time, and the Digital, Continuity and Disruption is planned for 2021. He has, among other journals, published in Media History, Critical Studies in Media, communica in media Communication, Journalism, Journalism Studies, and Digital Journalism. Catherine J. Bruns is a Communication Studies doctoral student at the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities, where she studies water discourse. She's been published in the book Water, Rhetoric, and Social Justice, a critical confluence, the journals Frontiers in Communication and Carolina's Communication Annual, and the textbook, and the textbook Cases in Public Relations, Translating Ethics into Action. Her next publication is expected in the journal Open Rivers, Rethinking Water, Place, and Community this fall. She serves on the UMN Water Council and Twin Cities Sustainability Committee and is a 2021 recipient of the UMN President's Student Leadership and Service Award. Dominic Hind is a lecturer in media and communication at the University of Glasgow and part of the Glasgow University Media Group. He previously worked as a foreign journalist across Northern Europe and is a fellow of the Rachel Carson Center in Munich. He attained his PhD in 2015 from the University of Edinburgh. Leonor Solis Rojas leads the environmental communication area of the Ecosystems and Sustainability Research Institute at the National Autonomous University of Mexico and is a PhD student at the University of Navarra, Spain. Her research focuses on the audiovisual communication of climate change in social media. Solis Rojas was the coordinator of the audiovisual division of the Mex Mexican Society of Science Communication and is a founding member, member of the Mexican Network of Science Journalism. Okay, so now I will turn it over to Henrik to introduce the motivation behind and main contributions of our edited volume. So I'll hand it over to you, Henrik. Well, thank you very much, Hannah. Uh... Just let me give you a little background of the book that we that we call. I think the important aspect, of, the important title of the book is the subtitle, Negotiating Rifts of Time. But the publisher wanted it turned around because, you know, climate change and journalism is a much more general, sort of easier to find in the library. But I think the you know, negotiating rifts of time is really the important part of the title. 
I come from journalism studies. I've been working with sort of the shifting temporalities of digital journalism, how different, how different forms of temporality emerge with, with digital journalism. And I'm not a scholar within the environmental humanities or environmental communication. But seen from the outside, I increasingly started to look at how journalism was covering uh, climate change. And I could see that journalism's problem with climate change, or maybe everybody's problem with climate change as a public issue, was so much linked to time. That there were so many temporalities compressed into the public discussion that made this sort of very condensed and difficult to get hold of and, and get got a sense of. Um, we use in the introduction the, the sort of the coverage of Anna Thun, you know, Greta Thunberg, sort of the different temporalities of activism, youth, gender, uh, as opposed to institutional time of journalism and politics, global time, governance time. So how, you know, the classes of, of, of te and tensions between temporalities was something that we, we sort of, we could see was, was sort of very prevalent in the coverage of climate change uh, within journalism. So I wanted to do this book on that, but having no sort of experience in climate uh, change communication, I invited Hannah along because that's her background. And she immediately thought that this was a great, great way to approach it. And, and we found a really good common ground. And, and th that led to the book that we're gonna talk about today. Uh, one of the issues in this book that is also addressed in the foreword is that one of the issues of the problems that journalism has with uh, climate change is that most journalism is, is centered on events, on tangible events. And climate change being a, a discontinuous but incremental disjointed process happening everywhere and nowhere really underneath is very, very different to cover. In order, in order to, to put it on the agenda, you need an event, you need a, a COP meeting or something else that can be your hook. But the continuous discussion that actually ought to be there, you could argue from a social point of view, is really difficult to sustain. And, and, and I think the lived time and experience time and the big timescales at stake in this issue is another uh, important aspect of it. This is something, a way of thinking about climate change that I was very much inspired by well, from reading uh, Barbara Adams' book called Times, uh, Timescapes of Modernity, uh, The Environment and Invisible Hazards from 1998. So we asked uh, Barbara Adams to write a theoretical foreword in the book in which she sort of foreground some of these issues of process versus event and how these clashes, you know, create sort of many problems for representation, not only for journalism, but for lots of other ways of representing as well. It turns out that, that this notion of climate change temporalities is a discussion that has been going on in environmental humanities, but in relation to film, television, novels, and lots of other types of representations, but not so much in relation to journalism. Barbara Adam is the founding editor or one of the founding editors of Time and Society, the SAGE journal that started in 1992. And in the very first editorial, in the inaugural uh, editorial, she writes, the focus on time is an ideal vehicle to lead scholars along a transdisciplinary path. It encourages dissent from established traditions and facilitates new ways of thinking about existing and more importantly, entirely new problems. I did not have that quote in mind when we put the volume together, but I think it frames it quite rather well when we have made the call, because the idea was, and I'm gonna ask, or we're gonna ask that question later, how that particular perspective caused you, you, the contributors to think differently about what you were doing already, what that perspective added or did not add. So this is what we really wanted to, to, uh, to sort of get at how journalism negotiates temporalities in different locales around the world. And we have South American contributors, we have Australian, we have Malaysian, we have European, we have South American, we have North American. So we have a wide uh, 
a range of contributions. We have no Nordic, no Danish contributions, but I'm, I just applied for research money to hopefully explore some of these issues in a Danish context. We have three speakers today, each of which represent a main section in the book. The structure is of the book is that we have an introductory section, which is Barbara Adam, Hannah's and my introduction, and Candice Callison, who could not be here today for personal reasons. Then we have a chapter, a section called Editorial Interventions and Temporal Mistranslations, which is very much focused on journalism practice and how that relates to the negotiations of time in relation to this issue. Solis uh, is the first speaker, Leonor Solis is the first speaker, and she will, she will comes from that section. Uh, of the book, and this will become clear later. We have the third, or the, so, yeah, the third section called ecological loss, uh, and Bruns is representing, so to speak, that section by talking about, uh, you know, the the obituary of a glacier in Iceland, and then the last section is called temporalities of politics and and religion. Sorry, and we have Dominic Hind from Glasgow addressing or representing that section. So what we'll do in a minute, we'll hand over the, the word to Leonor Solis and she will talk about her chapter and then we'll move on. Then we will ask some questions uh, and then we'll open up the discussion so everybody can join. Uh, so I think that was what I wanted to say. And so we can now hand over the, the floor to Leonor. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, Hannah and Henrik. Um, this was a challenging book because uh, the pandemic took us on the way. So thank you for the patience and everything. And thank you for everybody who's today like uh, hearing us. I will introduce myself. My name is Leonor Solis. I am from Mexico. And I was in Spain when, I, when this was going on. Now I'm back to Mexico and uh, my uh, chapter is about uh, climate change news in Spanish language, language, social media news, social media videos, sorry. So um, my profile, it's I'm a biologist, I work in ecology, then I love anthropology, so I, I have a master's to this on ethnology and also I'm a photographer. So I rather like a lot of things. <laughs> and that's the reason why I choose this topic uh, because also I'm a teacher. So a lot of my students were looking at social media videos and showing them to me. And I found them like really interesting. So now I'm doing my PhD on communication and that's the topic of my PhD studies. Um, so now talking about the chapter, um, I analyze uh, social media videos on the Facebook platform in Spanish speaking uh, channels uh, from uh, uh, native media outlets. So I choose two world native media outlets nowadays and uh, also Al Jazeera Plus and I work with other two uh, uh, media outlets from uh, the region one it's called Playground Magazine and the other one is uh, Collective Culture Translated Cultura Colectiva. So uh, I analyze the content of these four uh, media and uh, from the temporary point of view, I analyzed two things. The first one is um, related with the pension economy. Doing my PhD, I, I was not uh, like a, an academic from journalism, so reading a lot of journalism and social media, and I found out the importance of uh, attention economy in digital communication. But I found out also that attention economy is not taken in, into account in environmental or, or climate change communication. So I wanted to address that topic from the temporary point of view. Um, so 
I analyze in the videos the length um, and also um, how long it takes to give you the, the first idea, because now they have to grab our attention. So uh, there are lots of studies. So they, they uh, like theoretical studies say that they have six seconds to grab our attention and then they lost us. So I think that's a, that was an important feature and also clickbait features. So I, I analyzed that from the attention economy point of view. But at the same time, we have uh, the special uh, report of the IPCC uh, within the, the urgency of uh, dates within 2030 and 2050. So from the climate change communication point of view, I analyzed uh, how were the discourse going on. So if uh, like theoretically, uh, the, uh, the studies before show us like a temporarily distant discourse, and now we have like the urgency discourse. So I wanted to know how, how this was working in, in the social video. And so what I found out is that most of the videos, like 100% of them, they use uh, attention economy features, uh, features. So all of them know that they have to be less than three minutes, that they have to grab attention, et cetera, et cetera. But on the climate communication point of view, I found a lot and diverse temporal uh, point of views. So uh, I think it has change a little bit from the distance, uh, the time distance on the, on the videos I analyzed, but um, because most of the videos show present issues. Uh, that's, that was important from previous studies. Um, there, were, mm, there were use in expressions of the urgency of taking action in short term, so the short term is also present. There were others that were talking about 2030 or 2050. Um, so the good news is that there is no more like temporal distancing in the social videos. But the bad news is that uh, theoretically, now we don't know how uh, will be the, the reaction of the audience talking about the urgency of uh, the need of urgency of actions, et cetera, because also, from climate change communication, we know that uh, some audiences like uh, uh, paralyze with this uh, um, urgency or this kind of fearing uh, themes. Um, I don't know how I'm with time. <laughs> Please let me know. <laughs> I'm okay, so I still have some minutes. Okay, so um, just to finish, uh, because I also um, analyzed the themes and uh, another issues from the social video, um, uh, I found out most of them were also impact videos. That is like what other studies have found before. Um, but of course, because I analyzed 2019, activism was a very important issue. And Greta was, of, of course, an important uh, 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 pe people showing the videos. So um, what I found interesting is that, uh, of course, there's like the the young activist presence, very very strong, and it's a shame that the pandemic like kind of uh, uh, make this like going down. Sorry for my English, <laughs> and. Um, also, I found new topics such as an anti-natalist movements and also the occurrence of psychological illness, such as eco-anxiety present on the videos and uh, more uh, personal examples of taking action and, uh, um, and the presence of uh, some uh, topics or people that has been um, uh, recommend from the climate change communication um, studies, such as the presence of scientists or local people, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think one of the main uh, conclusions from my, my chapter is that 
uh, there are some potential benefits of the news uh, format in social videos that we can use and that have been used and I think they should be um, like, uh, I don't know the word in English, um, but in, like use more. Um, uh, and I think the other important uh, 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 conclusion that I found is there were that, it was that there were not uh, uh, videos about Latin and Spain uh, uh, topics. So it's funny because two of the media are from the region and that the world media had the resources to cover uh, Latin America and Spain like countries and there was not a uh, geographical presence of the of the local audience uh, in the in the videos. So I don't know I, I should stop now <laughs> and well thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Leonora. That was a great overview of your really interesting chapter. So now we're going to move to Kate, Catherine Bruns. Hi, Hannah. Thank you so much for that really wonderful um, introduction. And thank you, Hannah and Henrik, of course, um, for putting together such an excellent volume and for everyone who is in attendance today. Um, my name is Kate Bruns. I'm a third year PhD student um, at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, where I study environmental communication. And the chapter that I was able to contribute to this volume um, examines media coverage surrounding a public funeral event for Oak Yokel, which was the first Icelandic glacier officially declared dead due to climate change. Um, if you are in the audience wondering, how does one declare a glacier dead? Um, essentially what happens is that glaciers shrink in size and part of what um, allows a glacier to kind of continue moving and evolving is it shrinks and expands and kind of moves over time and eventually um, OK Glacier reached a point where it wasn't moving anymore. Um, and so back in 2014, um, a glaciologist declared that it was no longer living. And so in 2019, um, uh, two anthropologists from Rice University decided that it was time to commemorate Oak Yokel um, and what had been lost. And so they decided to put together a really wonderful funeral on top of Oak Mountain um, to commemorate this glacier that was unfortunately no longer part of Icelandic history. Or it's part of Icelandic history, but no longer in existence. So I started thinking about this project um, when I began reading all of these news stories in 2019 that were coming out about the glacier. And I was really captivated by how unique this particular funeral event was because it had this ability to both create and foster a space for Icelanders who were really grieving and mourning this loss of a, a cultural icon, you know, something that had been there for generations that they never expected to disappear. So the funeral served that purpose, but then the media coverage of the event um, also allowed global audiences, average publics like you and I, to better understand the significance and the growing impacts of climate change um, by putting a label on it, by you know having some particular event that says this thing was living and now it's gone um, and something has been lost uh, due to that. So for this project, I decided to conduct a critical discourse analysis of global print newspaper coverage of the Oak Yoko fu uh, funeral in order to better understand how journalistic coverage intensified mourning for this glacier by essentially relaying all the grief and mourning that Icelandic um, publics were experiencing and expanding it out to global audiences so that we could partake in this kind of community of mourning for what had been lost. My chapter is um, really guided by works from uh, wonderful scholars like Judith Butler, Rob Nixon, Carlin Kors Campbell, um, and coming from environmental communication, being able to turn to interdisciplinary scholars like these helped me to consider Okiokal from the perspective of a precarious environmental body and what it means to be of a marginalized group, um, which I don't have as much experience with. Um, and then the funeral as well to better see how it helps to intervene in these conversations um, and kind of pivot the conversation a little bit more to reveal the effects of slow violence that we really struggle to comprehend because they happen so slowly um, and take so long. So in the analysis that I conducted, um, I show how newspaper coverage of the funeral did a couple things. 
Um, first off, it served as evidence that publics can and do grieve environmental losses. So that's incredibly significant. You know, we feel connections to our environment. We go through a mourning uh, process when our environment changes. Um, but the mediations also were able to call in global audiences to this sort of community of grief. And that was incredibly important for this instance because it meant that um, this grieving process was unconstrained by physical borders. So, you know, no matter where around the world you were, you felt connected to this glacier that was gone. And it also was over, able to overcome borders of temporality because in happening in the media, um, those sorts of news stories and that discourse um, is there for an extended period of time and is kind of there consistently for us to turn to. Um, my analysis also reveals how journalists were able to stress the loss of OK Glacier as a warning for future climate casualties. And I think the events of this past summer um, from wildfires and flooding and all of the human losses that go along with that, as well as environmental losses, we've been seeing the significance of those events. Uh, ultimately, my chapter hails the Okioko funeral as a really unique and rare example of slow violence that was able to successfully garner publicity. Um, but on the other side of that coin, the event was also one that continued to exclude um, particular precarious and marginalized populations, um, especially indigenous communities who we know have very close knit relationships to nature, who um, undergo and undertake a lot of these rituals and memorials for environmental losses, but were in many ways excluded from um, media coverage related to this glacier. One of the questions that my chapter ends up posing is where are we at right now in terms of being able to feel for and mourn and grieve an ecological loss and yet still in many ways struggle to grieve and mourn the loss of human lives from marginalized populations. And how does that complicate um, this sort of story? And then ultimately I end up kind of calling on media outlets to dedicate more time and resources to covering environmental tragedies before this sort of tipping point, right? Before the stage where we say, this thing is gone, we can't do anything else um, because ideally we would like to be able to have time to act um, and avoid paralyzing and depressing audiences. Um, so I look forward to some questions on my chapter later. Thank you so much, Kate. So now we'll move to Dominic Hines. Um, <clears throat> there we go. Um, thank you very much. And um, thanks again to Hannah and Henrik for editing this collection so well onto Annenberg for having us up here as well. Um, my my uh, chapter appropriately comes at the end of the book and it is about endings. So it is about the notion of eschatology. Um, so this, the study or the science of, um, of endings, of, of living in or through the end times. And Eschatology is nothing new. Um, you know, religions and societies going back millennia have expressed um, eschatological um, kind of uh, visions about the, their society coming to an end, about the world changing. Um, you know, the shift from uh, sort of uh, pre-modern to industrial modern societies right here in central Scotland in the late 1700s was... Um, the end of one world and the beginning of another. So these, these things do happen. But there's also, when it comes to climate change, um, a very, very strong draw towards kind of fatalism and apocalyptic um, thinking. And indeed, there are um, some climate journalists and climate activists on social media who do very well in terms of numbers from um, peddling eschatological or apocalyptic visions. Um, there's one particular person who's very active on British social media who calls himself a climate educator who is um, is always getting what I would just simply call huge numbers from very selective um, presentation of climate reports. Now, um, I wanted to think that there was something that journalism could do which wasn't apocalyptic, which wasn't resigned and which wasn't fatalistic, but which still got to terms with the very, very real implications of what we're doing. And um, I think since the, since I, I wrote the chapter and since it's been published, that's come into even sharper focus with some of the uh, data that's come out in the United Nations um, IPCC assessment reports. So the reports that were released um, earlier in the summer and some of the, the leaks we've seen already from stuff which will be published in January 
showing that we are um, on course for about 2.7 degrees of uh, global warming, and that that um, will, even if we can then come back under 1.5 degrees, has um, extreme implications for the next 70 to 80 years, so within all of our lifetimes. And that is going to lead to very different experiences, whether we like it or not. And so, you know, it's not um, it's not disingenuous to be uh, talk about uh, an eschatological change. We are inevitably, based on all the science we have, going to be living through the end of something and hopefully the beginning of something else afterwards, which is uh, much more positive and where lessons can at the very least be learned. And um, to give some context, this comes from uh, the fact that I have a dual background as a journalist, but also um, interested in the sociology of modernity. And I've always been very interested in the way in which journalism and modernity interact. And uh, to recall uh, John Hartley, the um, Australian journalism professor who sadly died a few years ago, that uh, journalism is the primary sense-making practice of modernity. So actually journalism has a very key role to play in how we make sense of whatever it is that we have created. Um, you know, some people call it the Anthropocene, some people call it the Capitalocene, this kind of monster that we are, we are uh, condemned to live in. And so what I've tried to do in this chapter is really just to focus some thoughts um, and hopefully bring together a lot of quite useful different ideas to look at the idea of fundamental change in terms, not just of the environment, but if we're looking at it in terms of modernity as a whole, um, also in terms of economic change and technological change. So what I kind of, uh, I suppose, suggest at the end of the chapter is that by paying attention to these large scale technological and economic shifts alongside the environmental uh, transformations we are seeing, we can somehow um, start to depart from a realist perspective where we can understand better what is happening and then take that with us into our work and in terms of communicating to the public what is going on um, rather than the uh, temptation as I'm sure we all feel sometimes to just kind of give up and sit back and say well that's it because every I mean as, as the climate reports quite clearly point out and I think this is a really nice overlap between some kind of softer uh, genre theory that has come out of comparative literature and, and cultural theory and the actual science where every single day that we don't do something we change the future and every every single day that we do do something we also change the future as well so the future is constantly changing and constantly unfolding and our agency to affect the future um, changes and increases and decreases depending on our daily actions and this is something we're seeing now in terms of the run-up to the Glasgow Climate COP uh, here in Scotland where um, people are very heavily pushing the quite correct uh, statement that doing something in the next 12 months is better than doing something in the next 18, um, 24 months and so on and so on. So this idea of locating us in a very specific moment a moment which is um, always building towards something else and understanding how we can deal with the potentially quite overwhelming realization that we are in a time of huge epochal change. Um, but the journalism, I think, also has a unique ability to um, handhold through that. And actually, when done well, um, it has the potential to have not just campaigning, um, campaigning functions, but actually to help us rethink significant aspects of how we see uh, contemporary society. And that goes far beyond the confines of environmental journalism and into every single aspect of journalistic work. Thank you so much for all these great presentations and just introducing your topic so that we can get a sense of where the discussion can go and will go. And so I'm gonna go into asking questions to spark a dialogue and conversation with all three of you. So the first question that I'm gonna pose has to do with when you saw the call for papers for edited volume, what did you think? Were you already thinking about temporality, climate change, and journalism? Were you perhaps already thinking about climate change and journalism, but had to re-examine your line of inquiry to so take into account temporality? And also specifically for Leonard and Dom, who you each have professional experience in communication and journalism, and also Leonard with science too, you know, doing conducting um, biology, natural science. 
Did your backgrounds as practitioners in these spaces shape your interpretation of our response to the book's theme? So whoever wants to begin can go ahead. Um, I, I can go first because I, I sort of thought uh, about this a bit when I was speaking. Uh, I was involved, or still am involved, in a project called Journalism in the Anthropocene, which began uh, at Edinburgh University when I was doing a postdoc, and which, uh, with a bit of a gap for um, some time of work, I've I've continued to pursue. And um, the idea of um, engaging with time really, I'd never really thought much about time before, I suppose. Um, I've been very obsessed with content and also coming from a practice background of, of the here and now, but then engaging with and working alongside sociologists at a research institute and then engaging um, just through kind of general reading with the sociology of time. And, you know, you mentioned Barbara's uh, work on the volume as well. Um, getting access to that very rich discussion of how we see the future and how it unfolds. And also the work of Lauren Berlant, who sadly died recently, but whose work on genre and um, what she calls the expectation, I, I may misquote this, the expectation um, of the way that things will unfold um, had a really big impact on me on how I started to think about stuff. And so, you know, when I saw the collection was, was, uh, was uh, in the works, for me, it provided a very good um, forum to try and bring together some of those ideas in an area that I'd not actually worked on much before, but felt that I wanted to write something in order to actually help my own thought process and then to produce something that could maybe bring others into the conversation. Now, should I speak now? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, for me, um, uh, it was, uh, important that a lot of friends from different uh, profiles and nationalities tell me like look at this call like call was calling me all the time and uh, also um, I found it uh, just like the right place to be because I was struggling um, not struggling but ch probably challenging my, myself doing my research from different point of view and trying to uh, use different logics, uh, like the social media logic, the, the, me the media logic and the science communication logic together and trying to understand what's happening with, with the social media and journalism. So um, I was already doing that, but I've never, uh, I was just, um, on my research, I was thinking about the economy of attention, but I was not thinking about the time uh, on climate change communication and, and how do they come together in a content in social media. So um, I, I've never read about uh, like temporary uh, research before. So I found like a, a huge new field uh, that I, I wasn't aware of. And, and it was very interesting to see, uh, as, as Dom said, uh, that uh, I was always thinking about the content and the issues and the people and etc. But I never thought about combining who's people saying that and with what temporal um, like um, framework or how, how this is working and I found it really interesting and I think now we should uh, take it like time uh, a lot more seriously because uh, well we have very good examples here with the research that that we should well they know like Dom and Catherine show us that it's very important <laughs> I can add a little bit as well. Um, I had been sitting on this project for about six months. I knew that I wanted to do a, a discourse analysis of media coverage related to the OK Glacier funeral. And so I had that in my mind, but I hadn't settled on an outlet yet. And so I hadn't worked on the project um, until I saw this lovely call come through. And so seeing climate journalism um, felt really perfect. And then the temporality aspect kind of there you go, hmm, well, we'll see what happens. Um, 
originally I kind of been envisioning this project is emphasizing a lot more of Rob Nixon's concept of slow violence and it still does. Um, but what this uh, collection and particularly the feedback from Hannah and Henrik, who are awesome editors, um, was helpful for was it made me think about the importance, not just of the media coverage, but of the decision to have a funeral, because funerals are so intertwined with time. And to have this sort of climate casualty and to commemorate it and memorialize it uh, places the glacier in a really unique position where you're both talking about and remembering its past and all that it's contributed before. You're also understanding what is lost in the now, right? The fact that the idea there was a glacier before and now it's not and we're coming to terms with that process. And then there's this warning for the future. Um, and so I don't think if this volume hadn't had that emphasis on temporality, I don't think I would have really pushed that understanding of um, the, the funeral ritual as much, but I think this was an excellent opportunity to do that. And it really, I think, furthered my scholarship for the better. Thank you very much, all of you, for great presentations and answers. And I'm gonna follow up with, uh, with a question that sort of follows on, 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 on what Hannah said. Um, I think, and hopefully you agree, that I think one of the strengths from my point of view is that this produces scholarship on journalism that does not normally find their ways into journal, journalism studies journals. And I think it opens up an interdisciplinary aspect that I think is very, very important. Uh, in relation to understanding some of the present issues that we are facing. I think, you know, this is, uh, I won't go further into sort of my qualms with journalism studies. But what I'm curious about to ask you is, in, in, in because this is a fairly new thing for me moving into this, how do you, three of you, or do you position yourself in relation to the fields of environmental humanities, environmental communication, uh, and these other concepts out here, I, I mean, how, how does they play into your academic identity if they do at all? Uh, or how do you, how do you identify yourself? Um, I suppose, I mean, I was, environmental humanities was a word that was being bandied about quite a lot when I was doing my, when I began my PhD back in 2012, really. And um, it was... I was in Sweden doing lots of field work and working at Uppsala University, and there was a very vibrant scene there of people, and uh, people were sort of starting to experiment with this, and there were lots of good um, roundtables and residential um, workshops and things, which allowed me to, I think, meet people who I'd always wanted to meet, actually from different disciplines, so historians, social scientists, uh, media scholars, people working in the natural sciences as well, and what was great about that was the idea that we all had um, we all had common interests that we were just kind of struggling to put names on, I think. Hmm. But then in addition to that, I think that, you know, I was born in the late 80s. And for anybody kind of my age and younger, this stuff is just something that you would do anyway. I think for, for our generation of researchers, it's such a huge existential um existential thing and it's you know it's defines our our upbringing and our future as well that um i've actually not always seen it just in terms of being an environmental scholar i think that um what we're probably going to see in the future is more people kind of coming on board with this kind of stuff as it becomes more and more apparent and you know that's generally speaking a good thing but i think that um when i started out as a graduate student and even up until quite recently there was still a tendency to ghettoize um, environmental scholarship in many ways. And they'd be like, you know, oh, you're the environment guy. Whereas actually, no, what we're doing now is kind of reaches into so many aspects of mm. um, all higher education, teaching and research. And we're hopefully kind of breaking out of that prison. Um, and we're able to say things that reach far beyond the idea of a specialist subject. So I think for me, like, although I really welcome the, environmental humanities aspect of that and the fact the fields come a long way um i think what we what we're doing now really is kind of taking our research and speaking on much more general contemporary debates hmm. interesting mm -hmm. 
Do you want to go, Kate? Or <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to go. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is something I've been thinking about a lot. Actually, I'm in the middle of my prelims and I'm working on my dissertation. And um, I'm in the communication studies department, but much of my dissertation falls into the mass media and journalism school. And then I also have pieces related to anthropology and environmental communities. And so, it's been really challenging for me to articulate where my work falls. And I think a lot of times I get pushback from other people in the communication studies discipline who are like, why are you here? Why aren't you in like journalism instead? Um, but I think for climate journalism in particular, this interdisciplinary aspect is so important. And what I would like to see us do a lot more is envision using climate journalism and media studies as a starting point that is then expanded upon through the work and methodologies of other disciplines. So I have spent a lot of time doing like newspaper analyses and then I look at all my texts and I write up my findings and that's it. But I'm trying to, to envision that a lot more and say, okay, well, what if we started with doing an analysis of the newspaper and then decided to do stakeholder interviews or then decided to do focus groups um, and, and turn more to things like anthropology um, to really solve real world problems, to, to really connect with communities in a way that I don't think journalism is all of the time. So I think there are a lot of opportunities, but I, I think it's a struggle in departments um, for people to first off articulate who they are and then articulate why their work needs to rely on other people and why that is a good thing and not like, well, I'm just, I don't really know what I want. Like, no, this is a purposeful methodological decision for the greater good. Good point. Okay. And well, from my experience, uh, I'm the older one here. So when I study, um, there was like the specialization was like the best thing you, you should do be specialized, really specialized in something. And I was not a people like, like a person like that. So I remember biologists is to like be molecular biology and do genetics and do dra -ra, ra ra So if you like other things, it was really hard to get uh, like a way through that. Um, because I like, the, I study photography as well. And, and what I, I kind of learn is to change uh, like a, I don't know the change of uh, how do you say when you're playing uh, like a, a theater or something like sometimes I was an artist and sometimes I was a biologist and etc. Uh, and uh, I think the import like right now people is allowed to I don't know, study more general topics or more interdisciplinary topics. I would love to be in, for example, environmental humanities at my time or stuff like that. And I, I wasn't able to. But what I am I really like now is that at the end of the path, uh, now uh, these kind of strange profiles are are some kind of special uh, because we're like uh, I don't know looking everywhere and combining everything we find and what like being cu curious about other specialities or or, or I don't know professions or disciplines uh, in my, on my PhD I've, I've never thought about uh, discourse analysis or whatever and uh, I'm learning a lot and I love to learn and I think uh, now curiosity might be the the thing and uh, I don't know I think uh, for me for example on the book I, I felt really like a square like a like a square way of thinking like really scientist and uh, when I read the other chapters I was like oh my god I want to be like that to be I don't know <laughs> no uh, so um, the discipline also like kind of uh, fit you uh, but uh, uh, now I don't know what I'm saying but <laughs> I think uh, from one point of view it's important to to do whatever you like and also I think right now uh, the methodologies are 
probably one of the things that we need to think about how to combine methodologies or how to find methodologies that has been really hard for me how to approach the things from different i don't know how to combine stuff uh, from the methodological point of view and also and the, and the discussion and theoretical point of view of course Thank you very much, all of you, and hand over to Hannah for the last question. Yeah, and also just a comment too, um, in terms of just the ability for the form of edited volume to allow for more interdisciplinary discussions and different ways of approaching research that perhaps more siloed journals don't allow. You know, it was really, really interesting experience being, well, important experience being able to edit this volume and sort of you know, see how different approaches can be um, very beneficial for engaging with climate communication in ways that you don't necessarily see in journals. And even to um, consistently for my research where I really approach climate change through questions of power and representation, and that being a way of engaging with a lot of interdisciplinary discussions that kind of resonate with different folks, but also sometimes um, there's different definitions in, in disciplines, what discourse means, different among a sociologist and someone doing critical cultural studies. So the translation work that's required is really important to do, but really challenging. But I think thinking of other scholarly outlets like edited volumes um, are an interesting way of sort of attempting to, to do something a little different and new. So thank you for mm -hmm. your contributions to, to our, our volume. And I'm going to close with a question about sort of your future trajectory and taking in this experience with approaching questions of climate change and journalism in an interdisciplinary way, has this project shaped or sparked any new lines of inquiry for you or any projects that you're embarking on or would like to embark on? I, I think it has. I mean, I'm in the privileged position of kind of part running a, a program for international journalism students. so. I have the opportunity to take this stuff into the classroom and give it to students and, and basically tell them to, to go and read it. Um, and I think that bringing this kind of uh, stuff into the course, which shows that they are the kind of applied and sometimes quite theoretical aspects are equally valid and do complement each other, which is what this volume does very well. You know, we've got a real mix of material that sits alongside each other is critical. Um, and that, you know, in terms of, um the temporal aspects you know there's a I was actually talking to my colleagues this week about doing a grant application to study genre with audiences so look at things like unfolding of the future look at media consumption and see how your average media consumer relates to the notion of the future um as they perceive it in the media and you know these these as i said earlier these are really really critical things and hopefully we can take these ideas and do something useful with them because I, there's so much potential here and i think working on the volume with colleagues has really got me thinking about stuff that i would not have considered in the same way before i can add to um so i have done previous projects in climate journalism um and uh other works related to ecological grief but this was my first time doing something related to a glacier i normally do stuff related to water crises and water scarcity um but after i finished this chapter i spent some time thinking and wondering i wonder what the cultural difference is because glaciers are melting and disappearing all over the world and i was I started kind of reflecting on what is it like to be an American and to be in somewhere like Alaska or a Glacier National Park um, and realizing that these sorts of icons and parts of our identities are disappearing. Is there a difference? Um, so I actually just this past summer had a really excellent connection with a scholar from Norway and we were talking about this a little bit and um, she and I are currently working on a project kind of comparing newspaper discourse from Norway and um, in Alaska to kind of figure out how our two cultures are, are processing this sort of glacial loss um, and if there are any similarities or differences. Um, so far, there's a lot of emphasis on how our cultures uh, approach tourism and what is the purpose of a glacier? What is our relationship to a glacier? But I don't think I ever would have pursued another glacier project had it not been for this uh, chapter. So that's been very exciting. 
Um, for me, I will, I want to say like two things. The first one is that I think it's very important to analyze from the audience point of view, how like the time fr frames uh, worked, how is what's happening now with this um, um, uh, uh, time limits uh, with the audience, like we're out of, out of time and what happens with the audience with that descending that um, uh, already like uh, share with us that it's it's kind of scary but also it's an opportunity and uh, I think that's very important what's happening with the people that is looking to all of that I I, I recognize that for example I never uh, thought that echo anxiety will happen or this grief uh, feeling and because now I can I can say to Kate that that I, I I saw that news and I felt the grief even though I'm in Mexico a tropical country whatever and how these uh, things uh, that we share as humans we can share it through the media and with communication that can uh, I don't know allowed us to do something that now we have to and uh, what and how can we uh, these things like local global uh, talking, how can we um, like uh, build this communication within uh, the, our countries or our local realities through like uh, this uh, feeling of uh, the global or the, the planet or whatever. And um, the, the second one is, um, I think, no, I think that's it. <laughs> I think that's it, what I, I went to say. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone, so much. And um, unless, Henry, do you have another question or should I open up for audience Q&A? Well, there is a, there's a question from one of my colleagues in the, uh, in the chat. Okay, let's see. So there is a question to the editors. So I guess that's you and I, Henry. Yep. Um, <laughs> listening to the snapshot of contributions and discussions a while ago about disciplinary spheres and silos and identities, who in your mind is the main target audience for this book? So I think that we, well, you said, Henry, come from different kind of spheres within communication too. So it'd be interesting to hear you know, your thoughts too, but I mean, for me, I really, um, you know, interested in reaching critical cultural scholars, but more than that, you know, really reaching in, in the field of communication, in the field of environmental studies, you know, how to integrate common subjects and common themes that crop up across these fields, but often, like I said before, may perhaps are lost in translation. And so, you know, trying to integrate a lot of, a lot around these common questions of power of, um, you know, how climate change becomes, how climate change awareness in journalism comes to be and how the urgency of that is translated um, across different types of journalism, across different nationalities, and really thinking through, like Dom said, you know, you, it's really something that requires a lot more context and understanding of a lot more social processes than just journalism itself. So trying to get at that and, you know, ideally reach anyone who's interested in a really pressing issue, which is climate change. So hopefully everyone would be interested in that. Henrik, what do you think? Well, from my point of view, I think this is an important addition to journalism studies or, or journalism studies focus on climate change. What we discussed when we when we initiated this, uh, Hannah, was that at least from my point of view, a lot of climate a lot of climate change journalism studies is focused on political uh, journalism and or science journalism, and it also has this sort of idea that if we can sort of investigate this and come up with news ways of, or put or, or put it put differently, that the premise of a lot of the studies is that if science journalism can simply explain in the proper way what is going on, everything will change. Mm. 
And, and I think for me, I think firstly, that is naive. And secondly, I think there's so much else going on. So we wanted to add a different perspective to try to get into some of the nitty gritty aspects of climate change journalism, not starting from that premise and also drawing in and looking at all sorts of different types of journalism in which climate change crops up as an issue and not only science journalism and sort of departmental aspects of the, of the newspaper, so to speak, focused on that. So I think it's, for me at, at least, and also why I brought you along, Anna, was to widening out the discussion of climate change journalism and not only have it within these silos of environmental or science communication. Yeah, and adding on to that too, um, just in terms of the opportunity to discuss futures and futurities through our temporal intervention within discussions of environmental communication and climate communication that move beyond a science communication perspective where, like you said, is just sort of the idea that if you can accurately communicate the science, then that'll cause change in action and move towards environmental and climate policy. And, you know, the questions of futurity is getting at, well, what exactly is imagined as the ideal outcome from this? So what kind of policies are imagined? You know, what kind of politics are imagined and who's included in discussions of imagining what future, what futures look like and who are left out? And, you know, journalism really being important in terms of needing to include various understandings of what the future could be and in that way, engaging in moving policy discussions in a, in a deeper, more nuanced direction than they are if it's just focused on trying to accurately translate or communicate the science. So I think that's something that mm. is an interesting thing that isn't necessarily always included in climate communication studies and something that this volume, I think, tries to do with your work, everyone's work in it. And I think that leads up nicely to the question from Robert Hackett about the political implications uh, of this. And I think uh, for me, it was sort of eye-opening being new to this field that, 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 you know, I thought basically science communication, broadly speaking, was about, uh, or sorry, environmental communication was about science communication, but opening up this discussion, it, it was sort of, very clear that this discussion is so much more about many things. And one of the things is post-coloniality. Mm -hmm. And I think Candice Callison's chapter in the book underlines that very strongly. And I think that speaks to Robert's uh, uh, question there, because that is sort of very much trying to imagine a journalism that is not only talking about science and the Anthropocene as, a common, as something that is common to everybody, but a much clearer focus on the different tensions of the uneven experiences and who suffers from these from the fallouts of climate change and i think bringing that in to make it a much more political issue rather than a science issue i think is is a very important aspect of of the book as well and i think that chapter which is linked to indigenous knowing uh, also uh, she comes Candice Callison from, from an indigenous background i think is a really important contribution to this discussion that is not normally brought up so clearly in, in more journalism focused uh, studies of, of climate change. So I'm not sure whether that answers your question, Robert, but maybe Hannah can add something. Yeah, also anyone else who wants to jump in, but um, I, I think something that Candace's chapter and other chapters also add um, are sort of these questions of power in the sense of climate change is something that has always, it's been an issue for a very long time. And so why is journalism only just now paying attention? So in the US, for example, in 2019, there is a notable spike in climate coverage that didn't appear before climate change was barely covered. And now there's widespread sort of more public concern about climate change, but climate change has been affecting, for example, indigenous groups for a very long time and there's been communication about that for a very long time, but not included in sort of more mainstream journalism, especially in the United States, but in other countries as well. So, you know, in terms of the political implications, you know, thinking about, you know, now that climate change is getting a lot more attention because of these really visible extreme weather events, for example, happening in the US, happening in Europe, 
um, you know, how is that translated? Are histories being included that have been overlooked for so long? Are, you know, questions of policy making in terms of making the policy making process more equitable that can take into account histories? You know, these are things that need to be engaged in more in journalism. And this book kind of underscores and Candace's work in general really does underscore. And she proposes the idea of systems journalism, for example, as a way of being able to include in journalistic coverage, not just focusing on an event as a singular thing, not just a climate change event or you know extreme weather event as a singular thing, but taking into account the systems and the long histories that led to this. So that's something that I yeah, highly recommend Candice's chapter. I don't know if anyone else wants to add anything. Um, I would only say I, there's something I did recently which caused me to reflect on this, which is that the picking up on what you said about complexity, Hannah, I was recently on um, the Western Isles in Scotland, so the Hebrides and the Atlantic side of Scotland, and I was speaking to farmers, uh, well, not farmers, crofters, who are like very small scale local uh, people who work the land. And the irony there is that this is a very still historically quite poor community, um, very much exposed to climate change due to sea level rise as well, which is very low flat islands in the Atlantic. But also, um, you know, th the communities from those areas were also some of the most avid colonialists in North America. So um, somewhat like with Ireland, but maybe even more so from Scotland, we here have a legacy of people fleeing one aspect of um, kind of agricultural capitalism and then going to America and Canada and becoming very complicit in a lot of the things which go on there, which lead to the situation today. And one of the things which was very interesting there, I was, I was writing a, a, an article, um, but interviewing people is the way that they had started to recognize this as well. And they say, you know, we, we are victims, but we're also perpetrators. And I think that's, that's the situation that many of us as individual people are in, actually. You know, we are all complicit whilst we're all suffering. And the fact that that is something which historically has not come through in maybe reporting the complexities of those relationships. But what I found interesting was this was the first time I really interviewed people who were actually expressing quite nuanced, complex ideas about um, really about globalization and modernity. Um, and the fact that you can put those into very, very uh, public, banal uh, expressions if you want to. There's this idea that there is academic knowledge and public knowledge, but there are plenty of ways of combining the two. And, you know, the thing I would always say is that people are cleverer than a lot of people give them credit for. You know, um, you can learn a lot by talking to people on the street and they will often uh, tell you more than someone in a seminar room. So um, I think there is, there is a opportunity there to really actually take some of this academic knowledge and, and take it out, but also to bring stuff from outside back in again. I think we still need, Robert had a question, how do we make it accessible to activists? I think that's a really good question. I haven't mm. thought of that, but we will take that up. Uh, but you have this other question, Robert, about do we have any specific models in mind? Uh, and, and I don't really think we do. I think what we what we run at this volume was sort of to scan the, the field. But what I think from this from the perspective of time, I think one of the takeaway points is that 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 from a lot of these chapters is that that the past really matters. That that uh, that the coverage is not only about an, a, a, a threatening future in which we are all together but we have to sort of look at these issues in relation to how we got there. And, and I think uh, that I think for me in, in terms of temporality is a really, really important point that, that has to be drawn up that, and, and this idea that in order to imagine a new future, we have to look back and look at a different past. I mean, we have to reimagine how we got to where we were. Otherwise we will have keep working from status quo and working from that foundation it's very difficult to change where we're heading. And I think, I think in terms of temporality, I think, but, but how that is translated into a specific model for journalists is a different question. I'm, I'm not sure I can address that. Uh, so th this is sort of a vague answer. Well, I think too, also um, systems journalism, which I touched upon a little bit and Candace proposes and comes up in some other chapters, thinking Matt Tegelberg's chapter too on 
I'm looking at last chance travel journalism and trying to, and this was something that was really interesting to me that Candace Callison wrote about in her chapter about needing to consider slow violence. So these long histories, these issues of power, these structural issues, systemic issues, and needing to include that in coverage to make sense of events, but also making sure to understand fast violences too, she called it, so slow and fast violences. There are a lot of rapid conflicts and crises happening right now, and so it's not to focus too much on the past where sort of new um, changes in current political situations are ignored. So how to balance that and reporting is a challenge and something that is perhaps needs to be rethought in terms of types of journalism in general and you know different forms so Lena's chapter with looking at video social media videos and you know combining different types of formats of journalism to really get at that is you know perhaps one direction anyone else have any thoughts on that something that I've been thinking about that I didn't I didn't really look at this in my particular chapter because I was mostly looking at the content of the articles themselves, but I've been thinking a lot about how much more climate coverage we've been getting in just the past few years. Um, but the, the doom scrolling that occurs, right? When you see all of these uh, stories on the environment, and I think it's wonderful that we're seeing it more, that clearly wasn't the case, you know, five years ago, but all of these, you know, short snippets of headlines and photos are depressing. And so we're not even getting to a point where audiences are getting to the actual content and the news of the story because they're so overwhelmed and so depressed by the publicity that's being used to push it out to them. Um, I'd like to see a little bit more purpose from journalists when they are determining how to publicize and how to promote their stories to audiences. Because I think, I do think some media outlets are saying, well, we're, you know, covering all these climate crises and aren't we doing such a better job? And it's like, well, but what is what does it matter if no one is actually going through to read your story because the picture that you chose and the phrasing that you use to describe it, people are already overwhelmed and it's not leading to any sort of change or action. So I'd like to see more of a more of an adjustment in that particular element mm -hmm. as well. Good point. Yeah, I think that point of images is really important. And you know consistently there's like, I was talking to my one friend who is a journalist who covered the Chico um, Paradise wildfires that happened a few years back in, in California. And she was working for Report for America and really engaged in trying to get community perspectives on covering and making sure it's not just a victim narrative over and over again, but seeing you know, how there's you know, changes in the community that are not just reacting and accepting, but trying to contribute to changing climate policies to make sure it doesn't happen in a more fundamental level. Um, and she was saying that when she sent her reporting back to, I won't name the outlet, but she sent it to a sort of mainstream US outlet. And she had a lot of community photos, people on the ground, you know, showing different futures in terms of what rebuilding a community look like. And they chose apocalyptic images instead to feature. So showing mass destruction, not showing people, so taking away agency in that sense and just consistently apocalyptic images being used. And you see that across the board really as sort of a standard. And Dom touched upon that too, the problems with apocalyptic ways of framing climate change where it seems like there's just an end. You know, on one hand you can react to that and just give up and not engage in politics. Or on the other hand, you can sort of lead to sort of, you know, authoritarian responses too, you know, saying, it can be manifest in lots of different ways in terms of what that means and what politics should be in response to that. So yeah, definitely thinking about images is super important, especially since a lot of news articles are shared quickly online and you kind of just see the images. So it's a really great point. Yeah, and I also uh, would like to point out that uh, on like even if I agree with Kate, on the other side, if the image is like, uh, I don't know um, what will be an example for, for example, a, per, a, pe a person, I don't know. I don't know if that will also make the people click or not clicking to the note. So I think that's like the challenge because 
somehow I think media thinks that uh, these apocalypse images grab the, the attention, but I don't know if they have been trying to use another kind of images and how do they work? And, mm. and, and we need to like uh, also analyze that, like prove from the media and analyze as scholars. Uh, and because for example, climate visuals uh, uh, suggest uh, people, local people, etc. but we don't know if the, the, really the audience will click on, on, the, on, the, on the article or the media or whatever. Mm. And that's, that's very interesting as well. So Henry, I think you're muted, but were you saying something? We have a question from uh, about an emotional economy and a political economy of the same. I think that's a very good question. And I think, I think for my sense is that environmental humanities is sort of participating in the effective turn, so to speak, sort of trying to understand how, how various representations sort of latch up with various emotions. And there's also been that, that sort of turn in journalism studies, but they have not sort of been combined <laughs> Uh, so I think that's a really good point uh, that that we need more attention to. Uh, I heard a, a presentation yesterday by a human, uh, environmental humanities uh, scholar looking at a television series, and she had adopted the term from Frederick Jameson, the political unconscious, and talked about a climate change unconscious in the sense that most texts today, you can argue, would have that element in it somehow, explicitly or not. Uh, so increasingly, it's something that will that sort of seeps into all our representations and all our discussions, whether we mention it or not. And I think, I think that is something that maybe we will see increasingly that it's a topic that that sort of seeps out from being compartmentalized as sort of environmental journalism to something that it becomes part of 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 everything. And I think that the concluding the the afterword by the journalist Mark Shapiro in a sense points in that direction when he teaches what he calls earth journalism at Berkeley it's about uh, it's about make, making or attuning the students to see the envir environmental stories in the in the local in the near and in everything sort of unwrapping it from outside your own door rather than seeing it as a big science issue that is distant in terms of knowledge and and, and time I don't know whether that explains or, or, or answers anything, but any others jump into the emotional thing? I think that the, um, you know, one of the things that you get taught to do as a trainee reporter or as a writer, feature writer is to, you know, find the emotion, find the thing that's going to get people involved, you know, whether it's, um, you know, Steve Jones, age 33 from Illinois, or whether it's a polar bear, you know, there is, um, there's got to be that that character. There's got to be that emotional connection. And I think that the, the with the European wildfires we've just seen, um, the fact that the that some of the images which have come out of that, which have been used again and again in terms of you know old women standing in front of their homes, that kind of thing, um, they are intentionally attention grabbing. And I think that you know you, you don't need to work in in the media very long to understand that that is actually the primary mode of engagement for lots of um, news and particularly with the, um, the visual component of online news as well, where the picture will often be half the story. Um, now I'm old enough to remember when lots of newspapers, newspaper stories didn't have images with them. So you would just kind of infer from what was in the text, but now, you know, we have this very high impact type of media and it's a, it's a bit of a race to the bottom in some ways, I guess, because everybody has to outcompete everyone else and everyone's constantly redesigning their websites and, you know, redesigning their formats to do this. But in terms of the kind of, I suppose, the deeper idea of emotion and the idea of affect as well, as you mentioned, Henrik, um, you know, we are living in a world in which we are kind of trading emotion as well. Um, now, I'm not an expert on social media, but some of the work which I've seen, you know, about the way in which the social media companies um, essentially, you know, quantify quite complex emotional um, mm. emotional behavior, and and then um, I've just been marking a master's thesis on TikTok, um, and you know, looking at the way in which it's system for 
um, system for recommending content is so good that um, it will be able to tell what mood you're in and everything else. So we've we've automized emotion in some sense, which is a it's not necessarily a bad thing per se, but I think in terms of how journalism engages with that, we have to be very careful about not just kind of going through the jugular every single time and making space for um, more reflective and sometimes slightly more detached approaches as well, basically. So it looks like there is another question in the chat. So it's saying, um, related to creating more nuanced and less fatalist, hopeless discussions, constructive journalism might be interesting to look at. From what I've understood, it aims to approach polarized topics through an investigative, but also more solutions-focused lens, e.g. responses undertaken by local communities to adapt to climate change without disregarding the issues that led to that. Does anyone have responses or wants to add to that? I have like a clarification question. I recognize, I've mostly seen that as referred to as solutions oriented journalism. I'm just curious if that is indeed the same thing, but it's just being called constructive journalism. But cool. if that is the case, I agree. This is a much better approach. <laughs> so I see there's a hand raise by Lucas. So go ahead and. Yeah, I did a uh, I got a training in uh, constructive journalism at Swedish Radio, and something that was very interesting is that we were told very uh, firmly, this is not positive journalism, this is not good news journalism, this is in a way, um, this is non-fatalistic, non-powerlessness journalism, because they, they was, and, and really the motivation was to address the um, emotional toll that reporting can take on people and the extent to which we are in a way killing our own audience by overloading them and so there, there was this method developed how can you make um, people more in the driving seat as they are consuming news and just to quickly tie it to this theme one way that we were taught to do that is by drawing in the future is by, by asking people questions like how would you like this situation to develop? What's your ideal solution? Where would you like this to be eventually? So it was not only that, um, that simply uh, being more constructive hands-on, but also just taking people away from being in this awful uh, moment of being hit with things. Instead, giving them power by giving them um, the fourth dimension. And I thought that was fascinating. Hmm. I'd love to kind of, look at more on solutions journalism and constructive journalism, which I hadn't heard that term before either. But I know that there are some critiques in terms of making it seem like there are just sort of a handful of solutions without a political process needed. So, you know, over, like, skewing the messy process of politics and the messy process of trying, like there isn't just one way of addressing climate change and there needs to be um, more of a, how to build a, a civic culture, more democratic culture. And so how journalism can play into that. And perhaps that doesn't necessarily mean journalism proposing solutions, but kind of how to build more of an understanding of these historical contexts to inform about, you know, why there haven't been perhaps actions taken or why perhaps only a certain number of actions, you know, I'm thinking market mechanisms, for example, as opposed to the Green New Deal, carbon taxes instead of the Red Deal. So, you know, kind of, more of a, how can journalism promote awareness of that as opposed to just like these are the right directions to move in. I don't know if anyone has any experience with solution journalism or can add to that. I, I think that I would agree that with you, Hannah, that the there is a slight uh, tendency sometimes towards saying, well, we don't want to politicize the issues, so let's just, you know, um, see what can be done. And one thing I've noticed is a kind of surfeit of, uh, of articles that appear that often, particularly in terms of climate change, will pass off um, pilot projects and small scale programs as large scale solutions. So things like um, carbon capture and storage, which is, you know, so, so small scale in the terms of overall worldwide emissions reduction that it's, it's like, you know, 0.1, 0.1%. But the, 
I've seen several articles recently that are, for example, one from Iceland and one from uh, one from the US as well, where you know they say, oh, well, is this the solution to climate change? And you know anybody could tell you it's not. The solution to climate change is to reduce emissions and change the way that we we move and live and, and heat our homes and all the rest of it. But um, I think that that is it's a very convenient get out clause and particularly for that bit of media that likes to appeal to the idea of the neutral person or the undecided voter or whatever it may be who you know there is a there is a person who likes to read and be informed and thinks they make rational decisions now um i can probably say this because i don't think there's anybody here from the organization but i used to do quite a lot of work for usa today which is a very interesting newspaper because it is aimed at the average american for better or worse. So USA Today will cover climate change, but then we'll also have, um, you know, stuff about why tax rises are bad for, you know, middle-class people, whatever. But it would always try and dress it up in the language of kind of detached, you know, we're just, we're just reporting the facts, that's all we do. And we know, you know, anybody who studies journalism knows this isn't true at all. But that, that kind of thinking is really still quite dominant. You get it a bit here in the BBC as well, which is very keen to be seen to be um, politically neutral as well. And I know it's a problem. Um, and, you know, Lucas mentioned that he worked for Swedish public broadcasting, you know, wherever you are under pressure to maintain neutrality, this kind of journalism always looks very attractive. But you can't shy away from the politics either. Um, and there's, there's a, a phrase that sticks with me by Kevin Anderson, um, the climate scientist um, who basically attracted a lot of derision when he said that climate change is political and anybody who doesn't realize it's political isn't capable of talking about climate change basically and you can't really disagree with that like once you know you know and so there's communication strategies but i think that the you know the idea that we can find solutions in very small ways are um it's it's a little bit disingenuous maybe <laughs> Can I uh, say something? Sure, we have one more minute left, just as a note. Though. Okay, uh, so, so yeah, I may be, I may be um, suffering from literal Stockholm syndrome. Maybe I, I'm addicted <laughs> to uh, being the view from nowhere, but I feel like as a journalist, it's not actually my job to come up with solutions because linking into uh, what Dominic said, people are cleverer than they uh, than, the, than many people we think they are. Uh, what they're not though is what we are, which is we are specialists at storytelling and uh, communication. And so the way I see journalism's role and journalists' role in this crisis is that we are uh, prisms through which um, a messy bunch of light gets shined, and then we refract it in a in a more in a more pure way or in a more palatable way. And so in a sense, it is, however political, where we choose to, to stand and what we uh, choose to, uh, to, what lights we ch choose to pick up on. And I think that we have to take that point that Kevin Anderson made. I, I invited him to come and talk to my, uh, my news desk and um, simply by embracing the truth and embracing the reality of what's going on, we can change things, not because we're super clever and we have the answers, because we don't, but we can, we can, we can be part of this, uh, the world's conversation with itself. And now I will show. Thank you so much. Yeah, that sure. was a really great point. It's such a great conversation. And I mean, I could talk about this with everyone forever, but unfortunately we have to end here. So that, I was a, wanna, that was a good ending, though. Yeah, it really yeah. was. And also, you know, <laughs> you. we want this to be a conversation with journalists, too. So it's kind of a perfect ending in that sense as well. And um, so just thank you so much for everyone who was here and the great questions. Thank you to Dom, Katie, Lunar, Henrik, and Annenberg, and everyone who really made this possible. So let's keep the conversation going and stay in touch. And do be sure to check out the edited volume right here <laughs> and um, hope to talk more soon. Thank you so much, everyone. Mm.